what is your view of God? What kind of view do you have of God? Is your view of God like uh, a belief that was very prevalent a couple hundred years ago? There's probably still some who believe it. But there was a belief of God that was called deism, that God created the heavens and the earth. And when he did, when he was finished, he stepped back. And so he doesn't get himself involved with or interfere with his creation and with man. He lets things be. And there's another view of God that he only gets to, you know, he only gets involved when he really needs to be. Or is your view of the biblical God, a God who is so highly exalted, so great, so glorious, but yet at the same time, he is not like a man, men who get proud and say, you know, I am too good to help. No, he is so great and so glorious that he will, he will help us. He has the power to do so. He, re, he rejoices in doing that. Doesn't mean he does it all the time, every time I should say. But he does delight in doing that. And he is a God who does do that. Let's review from last week just for a few minutes. That in verse 1 of Psalm, 19, Psalm 113. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise. We are told multiple times, praise the Lord in this psalm. Called to praise his name. Three, you know, we have three of those several praises found alone in verse 1. And, and then the last verse ends that same way as praise the Lord. Praise him. Because he's worthy, he is a glorious and great God. That word for praise is a word that I want to remind you means enthusiastic, spontaneous praise to give him adoration, to give praise to God for who he is, to tell others of his greatness and gloriousness and what he has done. Because don't we praise? We, we might praise another person. Well, we may go to somebody and praise another person and say, did you see what this person did? That here, this is what they did. Or we may praise a, 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 a sport, a, I say an athlete or a team to another person and we're saying, didn't they do such a great job? Well, how much more should we tell others what a great and glorious God and what he is like. To give praise to God as you remember his mercies and what he's done. And how he's provided for your needs. And to give him thanks for that. Because he is worthy of praise and glory and honor. And also to praise him spontaneously and enthusiastically. As, as well as to praise him for his attributes. Who he is. That he's holy. He's immutable and never changes. I mean, that just alone, that, that the name Lord, Y-H-W-H, Yahweh, alone is five of his attributes, if you remember from last week, that God is a person, the name. That he's a great God. That he's self-existent and self-sufficient. That no one has brought him in existence. And he doesn't need anyone to continue his existence. He doesn't need anything in it from anyone. And as well as he's eternal, is what that name, Lord, I am, it comes right from Exodus 3.14, I am. And then as well as his immutability, that he'll never change. He is always the same. He will never change. And so we can praise him for those things. But there's more to praise God about. Look at verse 4 with me because we're to praise Him because of how great He is. And this is not because God needs His ego stroked like somebody does, like a king, who wants people to tell Him how great He is. Or you don't even have to be a king to be that way. 
There are people that are prideful and they, they want attention. And they may say, woe is me, I can't do anything right, because they want somebody to say, oh, no, 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 you know, you're, you, know you, you did a great job. This isn't what God is, is like. God, God is a great and glorious God. Psalm 113, verse 4, The Lord is high above all nations. His glory is above the heavens. That verse speaks of the God exalted far above all nations. Kingdoms, empires, their leaders. Verse 3 and 4 of this psalm is uh, of Psalm 113. Of 113 verses 3 and 4 is very similar to Mike Malachi 111 because if you remember verse 3 spoke of giving praise to God spoke of the from the rise from the rise of the sun to the setting of the sun and spoken of all nations praising him well it's very similar because Malachi 111 for from the rise of the sun, even to its setting, my name will be great among the nations. In every place, incense is going to be offered to my name. And a, mo- and a grain offering that is pure. For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. So the Lord is high above all nations. His glory is above the heavens. There's no one like him. That he is highly exalted. I mean, who is like God? Think about that. Who can we compare God to? We often compare people to another. For example, a son to his father, that he's very much like his father. Or, or just like their mother. Or the friends that are alike. But God, who are you going to say he's like? Can you think of a creature that God is like? No. Is God like the sun? Is God like the moon? Is he like the stars? Is he like people? Is he like an animal? No. None of those things. He is so great and glorious. There's none like him. And so he is exalted above all. Isaiah 40, 15 through 18, speak of God's greatness, that He is above all things. Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket, and are regarded as a speck of dust in the scales. Behold, He lifts up the islands like fine dust. Even Lebanon is enough to burn, nor is beast enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before Him. They are regarded by Him as less than nothing and meaningless. To whom then we are like in God? What likeness will you compare with? with him I mean you think of all these different kingdoms and empires think about these things and their militaries right now we have one of the strongest we have probably the strongest military in all the world and we have many bases around the world and we have territories as well that of Puerto Rico and Guam, for example, that are they're not states, but they're territories. And so we're all over the world. And so that's kind of like a kingdom, that an empire that, in a way, all over the place. You had the British Empire as well before that. A spread all that said that the sun never sets on the British Empire. I mean, you have, Span- before them, you had the Spanish mil- Navy and the Armada that was very powerful. You have other kingdoms. That we can think of the Roman Empire, the Greek Empire, Babylon, Persian Empire, and there's others as well. And their advancements in technology and and all these things. But they're nothing compared to God. As great as, great as we want to think they are, and as powerful, nothing compares to Him. 
I mean, look at Isaiah 40, 21 through 26. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been clear to you from the beginning? Have you, have you not understood from the foundation of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and his inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. He it is who reduces rulers to nothing, who makes the judges of the earth meaningless. Scarcely have they been planted, scarcely have they been sown, scarcely have they have their, has their stock taken root in the earth, but merely he blows on them, and they wither, and the storm carries them away like stubble. To whom then will you liken me, that I would he be his equal, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high, and see who has created these stars. The one who leads forth their host by number, he calls them all by name. Because of the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one of them is missing. I mean, God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. So he is present everywhere in this entire universe. Not just this Milky Way galaxy that we have, but this whole entire universe. I mean, we there are billions and billions of galaxies with billions and billions of stars and planets and comets in our in our galaxy and asteroids and and yet God is the one that leads them forth. God's the one that created them. Well, God is the one that spoke in them. And God, we would say, is more immense. That means that He is, in a sense, to say, is larger than this universe. That He, that I mean, He holds all these things in His hands, in His power and might. Also, His glory is far above the heavens. Psalm one hundred thirteen, verse four. His glory is above the heavens. So not only high above all nations, he says, he says, but his glory is above the heavens. Psalm 19, 1, the heavens are the tell, telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Alan Ross explains what glory means in this passage. Glory means all the supernatural manifestations of his presence. He who sits enthroned in the highest heaven is surrounded by brilliant and radiant light, and of it means that there is no one more important than him, no one more honorable, no one more powerful. So there is no one more important than him, no one more honorable, and no one more powerful. His glory is above the heavens. I mean, we are in awe at, at this world God has made. You look at the beauty of everything. The leaves that change colors. It's beautiful to see that. And if you ever if you ever anywhere where there's a mountain range with trees that have changed in the fall time. I mean have you ever seen the Appalachian Mountains that with all those trees? Or just even near, next door in Pennsylvania with their little mountains. They're beautiful. We look at the sun. We look at the stars. We look at the moon. And we're in awe that, that how beautiful his creation is. And then even the order and how necessary things are. The moon, if we didn't have the moon, we'd be in trouble. If the moon was gone, it, it, it very much is important to life on earth. And one of those things is the tides alone. Just the tide. It affects the tides. I mean, you look at the order of an atom and molecule. You see the order in the universe that, of things. And we're in awe of, of him, but of, of these things. But yet he's more glorious than these. More important, more powerful and he is greatly exalted. And so, that's why verse 5 asks this very question. That he is exalted above all nations. He is exalted above his creation. And who is like the Lord? 
Who is like the Lord our God who is enthroned on high? It's a rhetorical question. Because the answer is supposed to be obvious. No one. No one. There is no one like God and there never will be. No empire, no nation, no king, no president has ever or ever be greater than God. The false gods, the false religions don't come anywhere near in comparison to God. God's creation doesn't come in, doesn't come in close to being in comparison to Him. All the beauty that I described. And so who is like Him? Who is like God? Micah 7, 8, 18 through 19 begins like that. Who is a God like you? And then he continues on. Who pardons iniquity or sin and passes over the rebellious acts of the remnant of his possession. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in unchanging love. He will again have a compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities in our foot. Yes, you will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Who is like God who is patient and glorious, who forgives sin and is not angry with us as, as what we deserve, and really, but delights in unchanging love, steadfast love? Who is like Him? A God who does not hold our sins against us when we repent and confess them to Him and forsake them. He casts them to the depths of the sea. In a way, God, spe- it's, God is described as forgetting. It's not that God has his memory wiped or can forget like, like a person can. No, it means that he's never going to bring it up against you. Never judge you again on that because it's, he forgave. And especially now, in, the, in light of the New Testament, that we know he does that because of Jesus Christ. I mean, look at Isaiah 40, 12 through 18. Who has measured the waters in the hall of his hand and marked off the heavens by the span and calculated the dust of the earth by the measure and weighed the mountains in a balance and the hills in a pair of scales? Who's directed the Spirit of the Lord as his counselor has informed him? With whom did he consult? And and who gave him understanding? And who taught him the path of justice and taught him knowledge and informed him the way of the understanding? Behold, the nations are like a drop from the bucket and are regarded as specks of dust in the scales, on the scales. Behold, he lifts up the islands like fine dust. Even Lebanon is not enough to burn, nor is beast enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are nothing before him. They regard him by him as less than nothing and meaningless. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare with him? Who is like God? Who knows who, that here... He knows how much water there is it in and speaks of a measure in the hall of his hand. The oceans and all the water in the hall of his hand. Mark the heavens by the span. The span is just from your thumb to your fingertip. This universe. Calculate the dust of the earth by the measure. Weigh the mountains and the balance of the hills on a pair of scales. Who has taught him? Who has formed him? No one. He is known at all. And if you were to burn all the force of this world and all the animals, it's not enough for this great God. But you know what? This God, who is so great, so exalted, H.C. Leopold points out this. He has, he has two things, each of which seems to make the other impossible. He has taken a seat so high that no one can match him. Yet he is regard for the lowliest of the low in that he looks down so far. And we're going to see that in a few minutes of praising God for his grace. But Paul in the book of Philippians describes the Son of God who is exalted. Because this is the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, is also exalted like this. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, three persons, is so glorious, so highly exalted, But yet, you think about the Son of God, who was so exalted, who was like what we just described, humbled himself and came to die for poor, wretched, 
miserable sinners who are under his wrath. In the ark incarnation, Jesus was born of a virgin. He came, and then he grew up. He willingly went to the cross. Willingly was mocked. Willingly was spit upon. Willingly beaten. Nailed to the cross. Suffered the wrath of God. Died, was buried, and rose again. Died for his enemies. Is really... Not only were we wretched, poor, miserable sinners under the wrath of God, but we are enemies who, ha- who hated God. And so Philippians 2, 6-8, speaking of Jesus, who, although he exists in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped or really asserted, because I am God is really a way to say it is, another way to say it is that because I am God, I don't have to do this. But emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And so the Son of God, who is God, who is so highly exalted that no one can match him. No one can match God of the Scriptures. But the second person came Born to die on Calvary. So the question again is, who is like the Lord of God, as Psalm 113.5 says, who is a throne in high? Who is like the Lord of God? No one. And the answer is no one's like him. And so we praise him for his greatness. We praise him also for his grace. As we'll see in verses 6 to 9, God cares for his creation. He cares for his creation who humbles himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth. God is not like, as I described earlier, that when I asked, is your view of God like deism? And that is simply that they believe that God created the heavens and the earth, but he's not involved. He doesn't get involved. He doesn't interact. He doesn't take care. He just stepped back and watches everything that he's a god who is distant but that's not what the scriptures say he just psalmist just spoke of god's greatness and gloriousness but then says he takes care of his creation he takes care of it he has not stepped back and does nothing He's so high and glorious and exalted, yet he takes notice and cares. Whether that is feeding and taking care of his animals and sending rain, the water of the earth, that things grow. But also taking notice of his people. Matthew 6, 31-33, Do not worry then, saying, What will we eat? Or what? will we drink or what will we wear for clothing for the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things for your heavenly father knows that you need all these things but seek his first his kingdom and all these and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you and that means you put God first and he'll take care of you we're not talking about as some say that a health and wealth gospel that God wants you to be rich on this earth and so you can live in a mansion, a car. We're talking about God's going to take care of your needs. He's going to take care of you. You put him first. He's going to take care of what you need. And he knows our needs better than we do. But God's care and his creation is seen in this psalm. God shows in two ways. He exalts the poor and needy first is the first. Is, uh, it come, arises out of his care of his people. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes, with the princes of his people. It says, so he raises, he lifts up. So from the poor, the dust, lifts the needy from the ash heap, makes them sit with princes, with rulers. I mean, I think of a couple examples from Scripture. One is Joseph. Joseph. 
God who exalted me, second command of Egypt. Second command. And where was Joseph before? Well, we know that he was, so, he was betrayed by his brothers and sold into slavery. He went into Potiphar's, house, Potiphar's home. And there he was exalted position of second charge. But then Potiphar's wife lied to save, save her own face. And as well as mad that she was rejected by Joseph, who did not want to sin against God, thrown into prison, and then God is with him, puts Joseph in charge in jail, as second command, but still a prisoner, comes out at, from prison, and is second command. And so we find Joseph standing before Pharaoh, giving advice of what to do and interpreting those dreams. And so Pharaoh's response is this. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has informed you of all this, there is no one so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house, and according to your command, all my people shall do homage. Only the throne will be greater than you. And really, Pharaoh was greatly depending on Joseph for, many, for a lot of things. And attention... But I want us to understand from Scripture that he raised the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. Does not mean he does it every single time. That's not the point of this verse. The intention of this verse is not that he will always do it, nor do it as quickly as we think he would like him to do, as an example of even Job. Because think about Job. Even Joseph, we think of. I, you think he was, I believe it was 17 years that he was no, it was 13 years, I think it was what it was, before he, got, uh, before he was before the throne. 13 years he went through all that. It was not right away. He didn't go from his father's house right to Egypt. And you think of Job as well. We're not told the time frame that passed. But Job was reduced to nothing. That God allowed Satan to... For an enemy to steal his animals, kill his servants. One of them had fire come down from heaven and consume some of the animals. You had a great wind that knocked over his house. I mean, his children's house, I'm sorry. And killed, he lost all his children, the majority of his servants, and his wealth. The wealth was in, most of your wealth was in livestock and camels and such. And then... Some time passed. We're not told how long. And then he lost his health. His wife told him to curse God and die. I mean, we like to imagine that one day all that happened, and then the next day his health was affected. And then a week later, his friend, because his friends sit down and talk with him, and they stay quiet for a week, and then they start talking. To him and we imagine that this all happened uh, you know they're talking to him all that day and then God shows up at the end of the day and so less in less than two weeks this all happened but we're not told we're not even told how much time passed before God restored Job's fortune after God had spoken to him but we are told what God did the Lord restored the fortune of Job when he prayed for his friends and the Lord increased all that Job had twofold. And so God doesn't do it always, all the time. He doesn't do it the way we think he will do it. Because he did it in two different ways for Job and Pharaoh. I mean, jo Job and Joseph. And, he doesn't, and so he doesn't always do it in the same, time, same way. But what this verse does tell you is what God does. What God delights to do. What he delights to do. And he delighted to raise Joseph, and he's done that for others. But you know what? This points to one day what he'll do for his people in heaven. He'll exalt us after death. After we die, exalted. And what I mean by that is we'll be with him forever. We're going to be in a place 
that is, is a wonderful place. No more death, no more sin, no more suffering, no more disease. We'll be with God's with glorious God. A place where the streets are described as gold, but clear. Luke 16, 19-22. In Jesus' parable, he tells of the rich man and Lazarus. Now there is a rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. And a poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate covered with sores, and longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. Besides, even the dogs were coming and licking the sores. Now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. Carried by angels to the rich man, to Abraham's bosom, a place, paradise, heaven. Exalted, going from a beggar to the street in the streets to one who was a child with God, a son of God, an heir of salvation in heaven. That gone from, I mean, you are go, going from the poor house to the penthouse, that here at the top of the, you know, the top of a skyscraper. But that doesn't even compare to that. I mean, how great God is. Then also God, in His grace, exalts the barren. He makes the barren woman, woman abide in the house as a joyful mother of children. Praise the Lord. Back then, barrenness came, carried a stigma. Especially, back, uh, it carried a stigma in ancient times, more so than it does today. There's still those who, the, it, those who are wanting to get, have a child of their own, that there's still that, in a way, a stigma, but not quite like back then. Because husbands want an heir to inherit everything. The woman would be looked down upon if she didn't produce an heir. I mean, think of Hannah. First Samuel 1, 6-7. Her rival, would, however, would provoke her because her husband was married to two women. One, Hannah was most likely probably the first wife. And then the next, the woman was the second one because Hannah was, was barren. Her rival, however, would provoke her, bitterly irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. It happened year after year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she would provoke her. So she wept and would not eat. But the Lord answered her prayer and gave her Samuel, who became a prophet and judge of Israel. A great prophet. You think of Sarah, Abraham and Sarah, 100 years old. And 90, I'm sorry, 90 years old for her when Isaac was born. Even Rebecca, that here Isaac had to pray. And then we have Jacob and Esau. Rachel, unable to have children for a while. And then Joseph. And many other women in the Bible. And I even think of examples I knew. I knew in the church growing up, I knew a, knew a couple that they wanted to have a child of their own. And they adopted a girl. And years later, they end up having God had opened her womb up and they had a ch uh, another child. And so there's examples that God does that. God is so great that he cares about people even in that situation. But does it mean this is, this is the poor being exalted? It does not mean that he always will, but that he can and he delights to. He doesn't always do it the same way. And at a time when we like to do. Because as well, Sarah. The, I'm, Sarah was 90 years old. Rebecca, 20 years it took for, for, a uh, for her to have Jacob and Esau. That Rachel... That it, I think it was seven or 
seven to ten years, I think it was, and God opened her and gave her a child. And so with all that, we praise the Lord. We finish up with the phrase, praise the Lord, praise God, praise Him. The psalm ends as it began. Praise Him. Think about this. He saved you from your sin. You were at your lowest in sin. That you were just as the poor. Though that verse spoke of spirit, physical poorness, you were spiritually poor. You were condemned under wrath of God for an eternity and be separated from Him forever. Ephesians 2, 4 through 9, but God, being rich in mercy because of his great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you've been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly place in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is a gift of God not a result of works, so that no one may boast. We were spiritually poor, under wrath of God, condemned to hell, <coughs> enemies of God. But when we came to faith in Christ alone for our salvation, we were raised from the spiritual poverty that we were given the rights of Christ. I mean, we owed a debt we could not pay. And what, Christ, what God did through Jesus Christ is, is so great. Not only did we, we owe this great debt, He didn't just take this great debt that we owed and take us to zero. No, we're given to the righteous of Christ, which now we have immense riches because we have the righteousness of Christ. God, he breathed, we were spiritually dead. I mean, I like the illustration. It's somehow, uh, we like to think that we were drowning in the sea. Actually, we were, we were drowned. What God delights in doing is, is we were at the bottom of the sea, dead. And he went down, brought us up, and made us alive in Christ. Spiritually alive. And so praise Him for that. Praise Him as well as He rescues you when you're cast down, when you're hurting, when you have sorrows, when you're going through trials and troubles and sickness. We need to trust Him. You need to trust Him because God will not forget about you. Luke 12, 7. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear. You are more valuable than many sparrows. And Jesus talked about that one couldn't even fall, one fall to the ground without God knowing. Dying, that is. Are you, and, he's, and that's another passage. And are you not more valuable than they are? Oh, he will help. Trust him. Charles Spurgeon, I love what he wrote. Such verses as these should give great encouragement to those who are lowest in their own esteem. Alan Ross wrote this. Has life cast you down? Turn to God who is able to lift you up and trust him to do it. Then do as the Psalms finally does. Praise the Lord.